I'm Ilias Harantopoulos. I'm a machine learning engineer at BIT. And today we'll be discussing about um, real-time machine learning services and how they would go from ideation uh, all the way to production. So first of all, a few things about BIT. So BIT is uh, the fastest growing ride hailing app in Latin America. It connects uh, passengers with uh, nearby available drivers in real time. And all this is, of course, operates on a 24 seven basis. So it provides fast, safe, uh, reliable and affordable transportation. Uh, and it operates in Peru, Chile, Colombia, Mexico and Argentina. Uh, it's part of the FreeNow Group, which is a ride hailing joint venture of uh, BMW and Daimler. So since we're talking about an application here, it would be important to you know, get the sense of you know, what is a typical operation, uh, a use of the app as we would use it on a mobile phone. So uh, the user would uh, input their location, they would request uh, where they would like to go, uh, and then they would pick one of the available options that would be uh, you know, one of the available services that exist, like Light, uh, Beat, uh, Core, and Luxy. And then they would uh, request uh, to give a ride and a driver would be dispatched for them. So what is important here to note is that, you know, Beat is operating on a two-sided marketplace. So one, on one side, you have the passengers and on the other side, uh, you have uh, drivers. So the passenger um, needs to get a ride. So we must decide what is the important price uh, what is the exact price for this uh, ride? And also the driver, uh, we need to decide on who will be dispatched for this ride. So now let's jump into something, uh, into more specifics. Um, so we're gonna introduce you to Kathy. So who's Kathy? Kathy is uh, a machine learning engineer slash uh, data scientist slash AI unicorn. So she has all these skills that somebody uh, would like for an employee of this type to have. So basically she has uh, a really good background in probability and statistics. She has a deep understanding of machine learning algorithms and methods. And she also has, you know, during the last couple of years experience training and debugging deep learning models. And if you couple all that with her software engineering skills and her acquaintance with uh, data engineering tools, um, and also her DevOps skills, you know, you've got basically uh, the whole uh, cross-functional skill set that a development team should have. Of course, when we refer to Kathy, uh, it can be one person, it can be multiple person, it can be the whole uh, a whole team, you know, with all these uh, diverse uh, with all this diverse skill set. So she was described with a problem with a problem. So in an ideal world, um, in this typical scenario, we would have demand and supply, they would be balanced. Uh, but of course, as not everything is ideal uh, uh, in reality, we would experience uh, these, uh, these types of cases. So if we think about this here as uh, an image of the city, uh, we would uh, experience at times that, you know, a bunch of people would be uh, gathered in one place and they would, would like to get a ride and a bunch of drivers would be in another place. So all of this, of course, uh, is something that happens and will always happen because, uh, you know, the cities are dynamic and you can have like uh, certain events happening, like uh, maybe there is a sudden uh, road closure or um, there is a strike or even a concert that finished earlier or later uh, as, uh, from scheduled. So in order to balance this, um, BID imposes dynamic pricing, which would be an increase over the price in order to provide motive to the drivers to go into that place. And in that way, tweaking supply, let's say. And also, um, uh, this way, you create a better app experience because at the end of the day, you know, people use apps because they're useful for something. If someone opened up the app and they couldn't get a ride when they tried five or ten times, of course, the eleventh time they wouldn't even try. Uh, so, to 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 get these rules, 
uh, always when we think about machine learning solutions, we start from some legacy way of doing things. So maybe a legacy way would be to have handcrafted manual rules uh, for its uh, specific time timestamp and for its specific part of the city. And of course, that's too much of a burden. Uh, but instead of being reactive in this way, we can be proactive. So Kathy thought about this with her team and they said that, okay, we can provide a solution which would involve a first step to that would include a time series prediction. So predicting certain KPIs um, given uh, historic data. So all of this starts with uh, this is the first version of the solution that they came up with. So first of all, it starts with data availability. So we have two data engineering jobs uh, that they created. So one would be a training job, uh, a batch job basically that would be used for the training data uh, and a streaming job that would be used for serving uh, slash inference. So the the training job uh, would just would aggregate all these raw events uh, as they would live into uh, some uh, production data source. They would aggregate it in uh, specified, uh, pre-specified time intervals. Let's say ten minutes, five minutes, um, whatever the the need is, um, and then it would do some uh, aggregations uh, over these raw events and provide. Uh, something, um, an end result, something like this here. So for a specific time interval, we, we would have these values for feature one and these values for feature two, and it goes on and on. And of course, because this needs to be a real time uh, service or let's you know be more precise, a near real time uh, service. Uh, they also created the streaming job, which would uh, read data uh, it, could, it would consume uh, data from Kafka as they would come in and create the exact same data set. So uh, in order to uh, transform this into a supervised learning problem, um, uh, one needs to uh, do several kinds of transformations. But the most important thing is that you need to create your targets and your inputs, your input variables. So out of this source, for example, if we want to be one step proactive and predict uh, the next time step, we will create these samples. Like given time step T and these two features, uh, we would, uh, our target would consist of these two values for time step T plus one, time stamp T plus one. And the same for T plus one and T plus two. Of course, you can be as proactive as you want. And like uh, uh, given, time step T predict uh, T plus one. Um, and apart from this transformation, of course, uh, when solving uh, problems with time series, uh, we would have uh, also splitting the data set, uh, perform scaling, transform the time series to a stationary one, and so on. So at the end, we would uh, have all these features here. Um, as we said, there are going to be some internal features, uh, rides, a uh, number of rides that happened, number of people that requested a ride, a uh, number of available drivers, uh, and these would be, uh, let's see, aggregated on a, uh, on a specific timestamp for a specific part of the city. And we can also include uh, sp some demographics and information about this particular zone of the city. And also we can add third party features like weather, uh, events that may be happening uh, throughout town, uh, like uh, as we mentioned, concerts, uh, festivals, um, um, information about you know, specific holidays. Uh, and all of these then they would go into this box where the ML magic happens. Uh, so of course there's no magic over here, but we just, you know, uh, we just hidden it under the hood. So over here, um, anyone can employ uh, whichever uh, framework uh, he or she wants. So Kathy here used TensorFlow, but of course, uh, uh, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, LightGBM, and uh, you name it. 
uh, whatever can be used. And the output of this would be, as we said, the requested KPIs into uh, uh, one step further uh, in time. So when we think about machine learning workflows, uh, you know, we inherently think about pipelines. And that makes sense because after all, they're just pipelines. Uh, but the thing is that if you compare it with uh, a more, let's say, traditional software engineering task, it's not that linear at all. So you would collect data, you would do model training and deployment, but you would have to do these things over and over again. So you create a data set, you do model training, and then when you evaluate it, you go on, you try out some new features, maybe a new model, and then when you have something reasonable, reasonable enough, you deploy it into production. And then starts the other circular uh, way of doing things that from deployment, you want to get an even better solution. So uh, this simple thing here, usually when we break it down, uh, when people break it down to uh, tasks, uh, it ends up being you know something monstrous like this one. Uh, so you would do, a uh, whole bunch of stuff. You would do data fetching, you would clean the data, then perform some transformations, uh, validate this data set, uh, build a model, uh, tune it, and so on. So, uh, and it can happen, it can have many, many more steps uh, if you zoom, as you zoom in uh, more into the application. So, Kathy did all this with her team. And what would be reasonable enough that, you know, the next step would be to go into production. But this didn't happen. And of course, she was devastated. And this is a really common thing that many of these, these types of solutions never reach production. And this can happen for um, many reasons, uh, some shallow, other deep. Uh, but Kathy and her team narrowed it down to, uh, some, uh, to some specifics when it comes to uh, uh, training models, mostly. So the first uh, most important thing is reproducibility. So whenever we uh, perform experiments, uh, you know, a really important thing uh, for people in order to be reliable is reproducibility. Uh, so maybe um, you needed to uh, retrain a model because of some uh, major uh, update or upgrade in the package that you're using, let's say TensorFlow, uh, and you wanna be, uh, you wanna have your code up to date. So you tried this and you didn't get the same results. And this can happen for, uh, you know, a specific set of reasons. Uh, a really common thing would be, you know, you get data from one source, uh, like a database, uh, an HDFS uh, cluster, um, and then you train the model. But what if, uh, data in the data source have changed for some reason. Maybe there was, uh, you know, something wrong with uh, the data over there in the beginning and someone went and fixed it and performed a backfill. So the second thing has to do with uh, what, we, what we know as a concept or model drift. So uh, the data uh, change over time. And that means that you have to do uh, the data distribution change, basically. So you, you need to do retrain uh, every once in a while. If you do this manually, of course, it's a really big burden. And if you couple this with uh, deploying rarely, so then you can have uh, many features uh, piled up and a model that doesn't have you know, that good performance. Uh, so uh, one of the last things is that you know, what did Kathy do? So she took a problem, uh, uh, so she got her input and then behind closed doors with her team, they came up with a solution and they uh, then provided, you know, a ready product. So uh, throughout, but having no feedback throughout the development process. So this can lead to miscommunication. So it's really important to have feedback with, uh, and not only within the team, but also with stakeholders throughout this process. And all of these up, uh, if you pile them up together, they end up having a decreased velocity in uh, you know, adding uh, value to the final product. So then what did they do? So they sat down and they came up with uh, 
a specific set of uh, options uh, to explore to give a, a second version to the solution. Uh, so first of all, uh, they adopted things from the software engineering world. world. So for example, continuous integration. Um, if you're working in a distributed team, it's really good to be uh, coherent in terms of code style and uh, do some static analysis. Um, in that case, you can, uh, you know, leave these things out and focus on the things that matter, you know, uh, like significant code changes. Uh, also, you, you need to run unit tests and check for test coverage in an isolated environment like a Docker image and also do some checks in your software packages and also sell checks for um, some bash scripts that may appear in your repo. Um, so the second thing uh, we talked about, we mentioned reproducibility. So we all version uh, code, like with some version control system like Git uh, mostly. Uh, why not do the same with uh, data? So when we're talking about you know, applications, we wanna have a rollback functionality. And that means that uh, you know, reproducibility should be an option. Uh, and the same goes for, um, you know, so this, you can divide it into models and data. Uh, so we can solve the model thing by you know, applying random seeds into, uh, our, um, into our frameworks whenever there is some uh, uh, random factor there. But you know, we can't, we haven't solved uh, the problem with data. So you can do data versioning. So Kathy here used a DVC, which is data version control, but of course you can use other types of tools like uh, Pachyderm, uh, which do pretty much a similar job. And what you do uh, is that you can keep track of data sets and models. So of course we have, you know, specific uh, uh, release, uh, in Git uh, goes hand in hand with a specific uh, model performance. And this model performance has originated from a specific data set. So all of these need to be version, you know, you, you need to have end-to-end -end versioning. So with DVC, you can uh, keep uh, a signature of the data set along with your code, which would be a hash value of your data set. And then this will be, you know, the link uh, where this will communicate with uh, DVC repository, which, which is pretty much uh, a Git, Gita-like uh, repo. So you can pull and push the data from a, a remote source into your uh, local machine. So we discussed about reproducibility, uh, but now we also have the problem of uh, manual uh, training. So every once in a while, we would like to perform uh, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, and this could happen, you know, on two occasions. One would be, this would be a triggered event. Uh, so you can have either a new release from your version control system was uh, pushed to master. So you will need to, uh, if you have changes in your models, you wanna uh, perform uh, retraining or if you have new features. Uh, another thing could be, again, in this triggered scenario, that you're monitoring your uh, real life performance uh, of your model. So if you experience that for a certain amount of time, the performance has degraded, you need to trigger you know, a new training cycle. A second uh, occasion would be that you can have a repeating, uh, something like a cron job uh, running on a scheduled basis, like every day, every week, every month, uh, whatever the application uh, needs. And then uh, this would uh, run a training at scale, let's call it. And here only, you know, hyperparameter tuning is distinguished for, from training only in the scenario that you do hyperparameter tuning on a subset of your data, because it's, you know, it's so enormous that you cannot, it would not finish in a efficient amount of time. Uh, and then, uh, and dashed here uh, arrow, uh, this would be deployed only and uh, only if it uh, gets if it gives a better uh, performance. So when we jump into continuous delivery uh, to the second part, uh, so Kathy and her team they used uh, Kubeflow. So 
everyone uh, everyone uses you know tools or uh, uh, a lot of people have created some tools uh, for their own use uh, trying to orchestrate these uh, ml workflows um, of course there are other tools that you can use but uh, since uh, they use kubeflow we're going to talk about this one so what it basically does it's it's an end-to-end -end pipeline orchestration so you can have easy experimentation and you can have some reusable components in the pipeline, which you can then take them and use them in the, to another problem. And of course, you can organize your experiments uh, uh, in a hierarchical way. And all of this is done uh, on top of uh, Kubernetes. So giving you all the advantages, scaling up and down when needed, um, and basically having a one place for your whole uh, uh, pipeline. Like you can have models, we can, you can have the artifacts in Kubeflow, like models and metrics and all the other stuff. So from this, um, Kubeflow has also a really nice, uh, another tool called uh, Katib. So Katib does hyperparameter tuning, which is a really demanding task, uh, both in terms of time as well as uh, resources. Uh, so it is used to parallelize training runs in separate pods. It records metrics, and then it will give the best model. And the really important thing here uh, is that, OK, apart from the UI, uh, it's basically a framework uh, agnostic tool. So you know, it doesn't really, uh, it has no idea, you know, what's running underneath. So all you need is uh, a Docker image that will take some hyperparameters as input, like uh, learning rate, number of layers, uh, the optimizer, etc., And it will just post uh, some metrics on the standard output. And then you can decide, you know, which of this metric, which of these metrics will be minimized uh, or maximized. And it will just read the, uh, this from standard output, and it will give you, uh, you know, the best uh, model. Um, and of course, uh, this, uh, because it's done on Kubernetes again, it, you know, it makes it really easy to just uh, uh, scale up and run, let's say, uh, dozens of experiments in parallel. If we're talking about random search or grid search, and um, you know, achieve your results much faster. So the last thing that we discussed is continuous feedback. So this goes two ways. The first way is about uh, continuous feedback, you know, from uh, the developers, from people towards the application and the models. So one thing would have to do with, uh, of course, monitoring the application. So over there, you need to always check, you know, that everything's running on time, uh, that you're writing in the appropriate data sources um, and that everything is function, like functioning uh, smoothly. Uh, so you can use tools like Grafana for that. Uh, and the second thing is that you need to monitor model performance. So when you have a real-time applications, you know, uh, if things go south for some reason, you need to know as soon as fast. So. Uh, you can monitor performance, training performance with things like TensorBoard, and then you can have uh, tools like uh, Grafana or uh, uh, other stuff to, to monitor uh, things in real time and perhaps set alerts. For example, as we mentioned previously, uh, for, the, uh, for triggering a new, uh, a new training run. Uh, so you can check you know, uh, what happens and for example, here, it may or may not be significant enough to issue a new training. And last but not least, uh, we, we talked about continuous feedback uh, towards uh, you know, the application, but we also uh, need to communicate with people. So throughout the life cycle of the project, Kathy tried certain ways to communicate with the stakeholders. So the first one would be reports, but then it didn't really work out because reports were, you know, they're not dynamic. So what we want when we're dealing with data, we want to have something, uh, we ha want to have dynamic feedback. So reports, you build it, you send it, and after, you know, one or two hours, it's already stale. 
Uh, and the same thing happens with slides. And a really another thing is that, you know, reports of slides, they're not reproducible and they're static and they're too time consuming for people to create. So another option would be Jupyter Notebooks. But when you're dealing with non-technical audiences, you can't just give them, you know, an IPI and B um, uh, file. Uh, and the second you give them, uh, you know, an HTML file you would have, or a PDF, you, you again have the same problem with reports, only you have some code in it which, make, which makes it a mess. So this was not an option again. So what they found out was that you can use data apps. So we all love web apps. They're really uh, dynamic. People know how to build them. So one example is Streamlit, which is makes uh, building uh, data apps really, really fast. Uh, so you can use this both ways. You can use it for the development team as well as potential stakeholders to be able to check uh, what is happening. And in that way, you know, you have, you gain more visibility across your organization and you can be more reliable as well. So to sum up, we talked about how we can solve reproducibility with data version control. Um, concept drift and rare deployments by using end-to-end uh, -end, uh, pipeline orchestration and feedback by using uh, web apps. And all of these, they sum up and give an increase into the overall team's velocity uh, when delivering. So if you haven't checked out these resources, please, uh, they're amazing. So these people here, they've uh, gathered everything over the last couple of years that people have been you know, having really trouble uh, dealing with and they put it in one place so that was all thank you very much for listening uh do we have any questions yes we do thanks for the awesome talk you yeah um i really liked it and i'm sure the audience likes it a lot as well um we have a lot of questions but with respect to time we'll only take a few mm -hmm. Uh, one of the common questions we received is what we, uh, I'll just sum it up. So what do you use for tracking hyperparameters across your experiments? There was a question about MLflow and if you guys are using that, I saw you're using Kubeflow. So that also has a built-in module Katib. So what's your take on this? Exactly. Uh, so my take or Kathy's take? Kathy's take. <laughs> <laughs> so Kathy used the uh, Katib because it's... Uh, um, you know, it's, it's Kubernetes native. So uh, as things uh, have moved to the cloud, uh, they just use this tool uh, in order to have basically, you know, uh, a united stack. So not use, uh, you know, uh, different tools here and there. Uh, so it offers really good tracking. Like you can get, you know, when you have some experiments running, you can get, you know, the results for these that have been running. You can get the best result out of these. And when the experiment finishes, you get the best out of everything. Uh, so of course, as I said, you know, you can use DVC, uh, Pachyderm, uh, uh, MLflow instead of uh, uh, Kubeflow. So they're, they're all just tools. You just need to, to figure out what you want to do. And then you just select, you know, your tools right. to do the job. Yeah, just basically be, be aware of the challenges of operationalizing ML model and use a tool to deal with that. And another good question we received is what if you have anything to test your model, any framework or any tool for that? Okay, so Kathy used, uh, uh, you know, just uh, basic unit testing. So when you're dealing with, uh, uh, so let's say when you're using TensorFlow, uh, there are some specific stuff that you can check. So of course you're not gonna unit test uh, you know, the application itself, you're not going to uh, unit test the internals of TensorFlow, that would be an overkill. Uh, but you can check that when you build a model that you're using the, uh, the layers that you have built uh, are being actually used. Uh, and another thing would be that you could test um, uh, that uh, uh, you don't have, let's say zero uh, losses or especially try to explore things that can be fishy when training. Right, yes, perfect. We have more questions, but I really encourage them to go then on Discord. And Ilya, if you have some time, maybe engage with our audiences on Discord. 
Okay. If you want to solve problems like this, uh, feel free to check our careers page for machine learning engineer, data scientists, and data analyst positions. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.